like a nice intimate crowd, so uh, which is great for a Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, so I'm glad a few people could get out. Um, my name is Benjamin Lowy. Uh, I'm a photographer, and that's Caleb, um, and that's Mateo. Uh, they're in some of this. Uh, so I've had the privilege uh, of doing a lot of different work in my career, which is kind of why I'm here talking about it. Um, I started as a conflict photographer, and I spent uh, six years in Iraq and five in Afghanistan. Uh, went back and forth to Libya, PNG, Haiti, uh, South Sudan, Darfur. Just covered the gambit of stuff for about uh, 12, well, yeah, 12 years. Um, and w one of the things that's important to me as a photographer is the ab ability to transition between genres, and I think that's, that's really, really important. A lot of people get stuck doing one type of photography their entire career, and that's not something that I'm particularly fond of doing. Um, so this was taken um, the night the war started in 2003, um, and it was my first round the world image. It was kind of a very long story behind how this happened, but um, I was in the tent when these grenades went off right across the border from Iraq and Kuwait. Um, and I photographed this. And it, there's, there's sort of this longer funny thing of how I was, I was sleeping and as I was putting in my contact lenses when the first grenade went off, I like poked myself in the eye. So I made half this images with one eye squinting and um, half naked uh, with a gun strapped across my back. Um, and this started my career. On the strength of this image, I ended up getting a six-month contract from Time Magazine to cover the war. And it's one of those things that I've always had to uh, think about and contemplate is that my career started on the death of another human being. Uh, and specifically, as a conflict photographer, I don't go to Iraq hoping, or anywhere, Afghanistan, Haiti, I don't go there hoping that everything's happy. I don't go there hoping that there's going to be peace because, in a way, I need to document conflict to be a conflict photographer. Um, and that's a lot of news photographers and photojournalists need something wrong to happen for you to make images. And there is an inherent contradiction to that, to saying, oh, I'm an anti-war photographer, but I have to photograph war in order to make that statement. So I don't want everyone to die, but I need someone to die for me to make a photo. And that's something that I had to wrestle with and that kind of came back to, to, to plague me in, uh, with PTSD later on um, in my career. But for, for years, like, this was the bread and butter of, of, of what I did, of, of traveling to Iraq, of, of going on uh, primarily embeds um, and covering um, explosions, covering raids, uh, lots of photographs in morgues, um, so much to the point that that is, I think, everything uh, that was expected of me was, was photographing um, the worst parts of, of this conflict. Um, this was actually the Humvee that I was in, um, and uh, this was probably the worst day um, uh, in August of 2007 that, that I've ever had in Iraq, and it sort of convinced me that I, I, you know, and it took me a long time for that filter through that I needed to change. Um, this was an event where uh, I was actually smoking a cigarette uh, at the time and exhaling, and I was the only person whose eardrums didn't explode because uh, the pressure differential between my ears and outside was the same. Uh, and everyone else was bleeding out of their ears when this IED went off, and I'm like just staggering around, but I also lost all the nerves on the right side of my body. Um, a few months later, they up and died. Um, and I still have muscle injuries on the entire right side of my body from this event. Um, but it was this image that I made in Baghdad, uh, crossing over the Tigris River like while I was driving, um, that kind of changed my perception of what I wanted to do with photography. And um, there's nothing nefarious about this image. This is a 120-degree day in Baghdad. Man just climbed up onto this bridge over the Tigris River to jump into the river to cool off and go for a swim. That's it. It's a si simple explanation. But I tend to think that because, let's say, well, 
people bring their own preconceived ideas to interpreting photography. And typical photojournalism or typical journalism is supposed to answer questions. And art, art with a capital A, is supposed to ask questions of its audience. And when you marry those two together, you get an interaction where you bring the audience into digesting your images. Um, and because we have like a history of lynching photography in this country, because people sometimes want to see something different than is in this, this image became one of my best-selling images um, in my stock archive because people didn't know what to make of it. And this convinced me that there was a way to create an aesthetic to tell a story. That if I could create an aesthetic narrative to capture the audience, then I could deliver the content to them. And so I, I really tried to do this for many years, and this became sort of within my realm of photojournalism, became the way I wanted to tell stories. So I began this project when, unfortunately, uh, in, in 2005, the most dangerous road in the world was the Baghdad Airport Road. And um, I would get, after I flew into Baghdad, I would get on this thing, um, it was a bus called a Rhino, which is basically, imagine a New York City bus covered in 70 tons of explosive armor, which basically, if a round hits it, explodes outward to remove the pressure from inside to protect everyone inside. So it's one of these uh, vehicles where you press the gas pedal on Monday and it starts moving on Wednesday. Uh, it's incredibly heavy. You can't, you know, it, it doesn't have a lot of um, ability to drive, really. And when you get inside, it's pretty cramped, so you take the stuff you really need with you. And my bag with uh, my clothes, I hung outside of the vehicle. Of course, we came under indirect fire, and my bag with my pants got blown off uh, the vehicle. And uh, for some reason, I did not call my wife. I called my mom, because I felt like Marvie, who's sitting right here, would not have entertained this at all. Um, and I, I, so I called my mom, I said, Mom, can you go to the Gap? Can you get me a pair of jeans, and can you FedEx them to Baghdad, because I have no pants. And FedEx worked in Baghdad. And she's like, Ben, why can't you go to the mall? And I was, Mom, I, 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 there's no mall here. There, I can't. I look like Jason Bourne. I can't even work, walk outside on the street. Like, there's, like, there's no, no way I can go shopping. And she's like, well, I don't know that, because all you ever photograph are raids and explosions and, and going out with soldiers. What, is, what does Iraq look like? And I was like, you know what? Next time in a car, I'll photograph outside the window, and I'll show you what it looked like. And this became a six-year project of me actually photographing outside uh, of car windows, of armored car windows that I traveled in. Um, and it was interesting because it became a metaphor for something else. The square Humvee windows were usually Humvees of enlisted soldiers, um, you know, whereas the more uh, rectangular windows tended to be in, up, in, in much heavily armored officer Humvees uh, or the newer Humvees. Um, it became you know, a metaphor for a viewfinder. Like you're seeing, in a way, the audience is seeing through the viewfinder of my camera. Or it was about this barrier between East and West. And all of a sudden, I realized like, as this idea was gestating that this was exactly what I was doing. I was creating my own unique aesthetic to tell the story of Iraq. Um, when I came back home, we started this uh, giant project where Marvy kind of ended up collating all my images. And a second chapter ended up being this idea that she had where um, I was allowed to go out with special forces quite a bit. And, um, I would attach a night vision goggle to the front of my camera. And I ended up having a second chapter of this book, which was just shot through night vision. Again, it's more about in a country like Iraq, where most Iraqis don't have electricity 24 7, and definitely outside of Baghdad, there is no electricity, you know, maybe for a couple of hours a day. The only people who got to see Iraq at night were people who weren't from Iraq, who were American soldiers or any soldiers from the coalition. It wasn't actually Iraqis themselves. And so I started, I, I, there was this idea about trying to go into every new story that I was covering with a new way of seeing. And I think that was really important to me, and I think that's really important to my development and the way I think about photography. I think so many people say, oh, this photographer has a style, and that photographer has a style. And like, you know when you see you know, a Steve McCurry image, it's like super hyper color realistic, or there's some, you know, crazy layering of foreground and background elements in Alex Webb's work. Like every photographer has a style. I kind of decided, really, in this my career, that I didn't want to have that. I wanted each story 
to tell me how to photograph it. Uh, this was the oil spill, the Deepwater Horizon. I went down there, everyone was covering it in the way that you cover an oil spill. And we all grew up with the tropes of like the Exxon Valdez, and I remember seeing all those pictures of guys coming out of the water covered in oil, but that didn't exist for this story because it happened out in international waters. So how do you tell the story about oil? And as I was flying over the Gulf, I realized how beautiful the images were of the oil resting on the water. So I ended up going back into um, the Gulf and renting a boat with a friend of mine and jumping in you know, where it was shallow enough for me to stand in the Gulf and shooting straight down. And so these aren't made like from the air. These aren't aerials. These are made from like me holding a camera straight up over the water. I'm, I sacrificed my leg hair because the Coast Guard wouldn't. I know oh, who just caught me looking at my leg. No. Uh, um, <laughs> But the Coast Guard wouldn't let me go back into port with oil covering my legs. So I had to sit there and either shave my legs on the boat every day to get the oil off or use Blue Dawn just to remove the oil from my own legs to, to make these images. And this was successful for me just because, again, it's creating a different visual narrative to tell a story. Um, when I came back from doing all of the hardcore footage, I was blown out. I, I, I was blown out. I was burnt out of doing war zone work. And uh, lucky enough, I have a lot of friends in the industry who are like, you know, why don't you try doing sports? Why don't you try, you know, that peak moment of going into sports photography is very much like covering, um, you know, war zone photography. So I had a really great commission uh, from a magazine to go to Sochi Olympics and to just make art. I wasn't on a deadline. I was, they were just saying, can you photograph sports in a completely different way than sports is photographed? And so for me, that was saying, I know, uh, you know we all see like all sport and Getty images and what the wires do in terms of covering sport. How can I photograph it differently? And it was really about one of the best piece of advice I ever got was from David Burnett, who um, I knew before I even went to Iraq when I was still a student in university. Uh, and in 2002, he told me, if you ever see a big crowd of photographers, just go someplace else. Just go someplace else and try something. Because even if you fail, you'll end up not, you'll fail, but where no one else is around you. So I tried this at the ski jump. And ski jump is by far the hardest thing I've ever had to photograph. Because you're actually not standing in front of the skiers on the ramp. You're on a staircase, a very steep staircase to the side. So it's kind of an optical illusion when the ski jumper comes off and then drifts past you. Because they go up, they come down, and they go to the side. And so it freaks out autofocus on every camera. And because it's also done at night. Um, and it makes me appreciate if anyone ever had to photograph that with a manual camera. So I was like, you know what, why don't I just go up under the tail of the, the ramp because no photographers are there. And so I crawled up and I'm underneath and all I saw were butts flying away into the night. So in that part, the advice didn't work out great um, to go where none of the other photographs were. But here, this was aerials and all the photographers, including David Burnett, were there and they were all standing in one spot. So he didn't take his own advice. And I was like, you know what? I'm just not going to stand here with everyone else. Uh, and one of the great things about Sochi was I was slope certified. So I was allowed to have crampons and an ice pick. And I kept on climbing up the side of the aerial. And this is very 70 degree hill that the athletes go down. And then when they come up, they have to do all these tricks. And so I climb up. And Sochi, uh, for, as the Winter Olympics goes, was hot. Like, it was 55, 60 degrees on most of the days. I was wearing shorts uh, in the snow. So you have, like, snow boots on with crampons wearing, like, shorts. And everyone looked ridiculous. Thankfully, no one photographed the photographers. And as I'm climbing up, I'm like, I'm sweating profusely. And I'm climbing up. There's one hand. I had four cameras around my neck. And I'm going like this up the side of the slope. And my cameras are dropping into the melting ice and getting water all over them. So I'm wiping the sweat and nose grease off my face in, in Sochi. Yeah, and, and I'm wiping off the, the front of my lens element, and all of a sudden, I'm getting these crazy streaks of light. Um, and it's all nose grease that, and, like, and like melting snow that's on front of my camera. And I was like, oh, this is fun. 
and no one else was standing next to me, so I, I couldn't have done it wrong because there was no one else there to, to measure up against. Um, so I really got into doing a lot of different sports, and then I, I, I thought, well, what about if I immerse myself? In the same way, like when I was in Iraq and I did an embed, and I lived with soldiers, and I lived in the same barracks, and I ate the same food, and I, you know, I, I shared their life with them while I photographed them. Well, what if I do that with another project? And I had. Uh, the great fortune of meeting a friend of mine who works for the Olympic Committee for Wrestling. And when wrestling was taken out of the Olympics, uh, we were part of the Save Wrestling campaign. And we went around the world to different places where they have uh, traditional wrestling techniques to photograph those traditional techniques. And one of the interesting things about wrestling, it's the world's oldest sport. And in two different places where it developed about 6,000 years ago was in ancient Greece and in Sudan. Now in ancient Greece, it was developed as a way to train soldiers without having them use weapons. But in Sudan, uh, it was used by uh, shepherds to argue for conflict resolution to figure out who, which sheep or cows were in whose flock. And they would wrestle, so they'd say, okay, it's instead of rock, paper, scissors, we're just gonna wrestle, and whoever wins gets to keep this cow. And so and two, and you had this sport start. One was for warfare with the Greeks, and one was for conflict resolution with the Sudanese. And it's the world's oldest sport, and now it's being thrown out of the Olympics, and we're like, we're going to go to all these places. And we decided, but we're also going to wrestle. So we're going to wrestle, and then we're going to photograph wrestling. So I want you to imagine that I am in the same loincloth that these guys are in when I made this picture. I won't show you the picture because once you see me in a loincloth, you can't unsee me in a loincloth. <laughs> but basically, um, the, the guy on the right, he's about 260 pounds, he's who they decided that I was going to wrestle. Like, you're American, you have good protein, you could totally wrestle this guy. He spent nine minutes throwing me around. I could not move my neck for about a week afterwards. Um, but the, the best part was is that in these wrestling temples in India, this is called Kushti Wrestling, uh, you have novice wrestlers who come in and live there. Like everyone lives there until about, uh, they're about 20 years old. And if they go professional, they live there their whole lives. So you have these eight-year-old novice wrestlers who were just sent there by their families in first start. And those are the people who put the loincloth on you. So as soon as I arrived in the morning, I'm like stripped naked by an eight-year-old. And he has to like tie on this loincloth onto me. And it's very tight. And uh, one of my finer moments. But you know, just by being there and saying, oh, I had wrestled with these guys, I got to go into these pits, which are con considered sacred. Um, and photograph them throughout the whole day and in places where most people don't get to go. And again, that's the thing that I love about photography is that you get to do things that most people don't get to do. And for a long time when I did war photography, I thought journalists are sort of the modern day sin eaters of, 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 of ancient times. And like the sin eaters in the Catholic Church back during the Middle Ages were people who took other people's sin on them so that they could be free of sin. And it's this whole idea is like we could witness the worst parts of the world and show it to other people so they don't have to see it for themselves. But at the same token, that could be for any part of the world. Uh, and it could be for any subject matter. It doesn't have to be the worst parts. And, and so many people get, get caught up with when you get into photography, you get into photojournalism. It always starts, you start with street photography. And I can't tell you how many street photographer classes and photo one classes that I've held and that I have... Um, you know, workshopped, where uh, even back when people were shooting film, but always it's going to be a young person who's just starting photography, and in their best first hundred frames that they take, there's going to be a homeless person in the photograph, because it's an other. And you walk around New York City, and it's so easy to take a picture of a homeless person who's just sitting there, someone down and dejected and not paying attention to you, doing something that other than what you know. And that's the easiest, easiest photograph for everyone to make. When I started photography and I was wandering around here in the city in 2002, there used to be all those kids who are homeless, who wear green, who have the facial tattoos with the dogs. They go into Barnes & Noble's bathroom in Union Square and shoot up all the time. And it was some of the first photos I ever made uh, when I started photography was kids shooting up in the bathroom in Barnes & Noble's in Union Square. 
because it's the easiest photo to make. Once you talk your way in, it's not a hard thing to do. And so we have to like push ourselves beyond that. There's more to photography than just the other and the things we don't know and the thing that seems so foreign to us that we might as well photograph that. Um, and so I spent a lot of time photographing wrestling and this idea blossomed on me that again, there's some beautiful things in the world that need to be photographed, not just the most horrible things. Um, I end up having a lot of assignments that take me to foreign places. Um, and I try and work these ideas into what I see. Like, how do you give a voice to people um, that don't have one? This is an e-waste dump in Ghana. And this is something that I just did on an assignment. This wasn't my assignment, but I just went back and forth and spoke to these kids. I had one little tiny camera around my neck. I wore a Hawaiian shirt. I was just trying to not be a journalist here and just talk to people. And again, I kind of almost felt like I was burning out because no one cares. These are all 15-year-old kids who are working in basically a swamp covered with soot. You never know if like, there's like a sinkhole that's going to open up and swallow you. And this is where the entire African continent's copper, recycled copper, is run through. It's a giant e-waste dump in, in Ghana. Um, and this guy actually, he, 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 Mohammed, he, he like stayed with me the whole time I was there helping me translate. And it was just the idea that he has this like, this cool summer shirt on and you know, I, I, how it all filters and how we're all connected. And I, I was getting so burnt out doing this. Um, and I kept on thinking back to like this idea that there's something that's more beautiful out there. So. Again, I did the opioid crisis. This I did for Time Magazine. And I felt like I was just doing the tropes of photography. I was just doing the same stuff that we see every day did about, you what? I went out with cops, yeah. I went out with cops. Um, to even campaign stuff. And this was sort of my, this was my breaking point, like covering, uh, you know, the 2016 campaign and going, you know, and you know, I worked for Time Magazine, so I had like really, really good access to both uh, Hillary Clinton and to Donald Trump. And he actually sat for for a portrait for me, which was um, incidentally fun in a weird way. Um, but I was like, there's there's more to the world than just doing that. And if I get stuck to just doing photojournalism and just doing this, I'm not going to see there's all this other stuff that's out there. Um, and I have a family. I, I have a wonderful wife who has photographed with me, Marvy, she's right there, for many years. And I have two, two little boys now, and I didn't want to just surround myself in like the, the worst parts of the world. I wanted to do something that was pretty beautiful. And when I started making that clear to editors, I started getting a few assignments that took me to some interesting places to do work that was totally different. This is shot in Iceland, which I feel like now Iceland has more New Yorkers in it than Icelanders. Um, <laughs> but I went there before it was super popular. Um, and this is shot from a plane looking down at uh, what happens is you have these things called braided rivers, which are volcanic rock that slowly make their way down because of glacier movement and spread the water around into tributaries. So this is all just one big river that's been broken up by volcanic rock and sediment. Um, and basically, uh, Matteo, if you remember your rock lesson from last night, it's going from igneous to sedimentary. Yeah, OK. Um, or like, you know, standing in, uh, you know, uh, a bay of break, breaking up um, icebergs. And I, I'll answer questions later, pal. But so I realized there was more to it. And, 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 and editors started sending me because I was willing to do something different than other photojournalists were, which is breaking out of one genre and go into different genres. Uh, this is uh, in the Magellan Straits off the coast of Antarctica. Um, I, and I think maybe I'm the type of person, and I recommend this for any business, but specifically for, you know, I only know this business, is taking chances and taking gambles. Um, I tend to just say, when someone asks if I can do something, I just say, yes, I can do it. So when I had a client call and say, oh, can you do a so, you know, solo with a tracker 
and search for unhabituated pumas who have never seen human beings in um, the Tor del Pine region of Chile, um, I was like, yeah, I could totally do that. And I could totally cover my entire body with baby puma feces uh, for four days and, and sleep in the den of, of female pumas. And, you know, serendipity happens. National Geographic had an entire expedition out to, for the channel for three months trying to catch a puma killing a wanako in this field uh, of, um, of it's a, a sedentary field that is very fallow. So wanakos, and wanakos are like the stupid cousin of the llama. <laughs> because they look the same, but they basically stand around, they don't run, and they go, ah, eh, eat me. And, you know, um, but this was on my second day in Chile. Like, Geographic just left. I just saw the photographer leave, and they're like, we spent three months here, and we never got a kill, ever. And on my second day, I'm like running down the side of a mountain with uh, a 600 millimeter lens with an extender on top of a, a, a large body camera. And I'm running down, and I'm seeing this happen in front of me. Uh, we slept next to this female. Again, I, I think maybe it was the smell of the baby puma feces covering my entire body, which we sort of edited out of our mind. But the greatest part is these pumas had never seen human beings before. She had already killed a wanako that day, and she killed this other wanako and dragged it back to the den and left it in front of us. So we're like, is she doing this for us? This is really weird because she doesn't understand we're not pumas. We just smell like baby pumas. Though I don't know if I would confuse my own children for pumas if they weren't and covered in, but you know, to each their own. There's always that moment when um, you're downwind uh, of an animal and all of a sudden I'm not covered in baby puma feces, it's just my own. Uh, and, and, and she begins stalking you. And this is actually one of these really interesting things that I learned when I was in Baghdad. Um, Saddam Hussein and his sons kept two uh, tigers that they would feed people to in what became the green zone. In one of the palaces there was a cage with two tigers that they fed people to, that they, when they, you know, just as a way to terrorize the populace. And in a PR stunt after the war, uh, the military brought in uh, a zoologist from the San Diego Zoo to help train these tigers off the taste of human flesh so they didn't have to put them down. And he took me into the cage and showed me how to photograph wild animals, specifically wild animals that know what it's like to eat a human being. The camera is basically a giant eye to an animal. So if you're photographing an animal, if you're staring at it and you're not blinking at it, it thinks that you're in a struggle for dominance and it is going to get pissed off. So he said one of the most important things you do with that camera when you're facing a predator is to blink your camera like you're blinking your eye and just take it up and down like you're blinking to show your submissive to that animal. And it's actually a lesson I brought to here when I remember this and I'm staying there and my tracker's right next to me and he's getting ready to like pull out a knife because don't, we don't know what's gonna happen and I just start blinking my camera because she's about 20 feet from me and she just walked right past us. So at least a lesson from uh, a war zone helped with uh, nature. Um, I had it, so where I started transitioning into underwater work was after this Puma stuff, I started getting like these uh, assignments from clients who were like, can you just do crazy stuff? And I'm the type of person who says, yes, how much? I like to call myself a visual gigolo. Um, and uh, so uh, there was a, a story in Palau on illegal fishing for the New York Times. And it was actually eventually an investigative piece that won the Pulitzer. Um, and I did a segment in Plow on fish aggregating devices, which are these giant ropes that go down into the sea, which fish swim around, and then illegal fishermen come in with nets and sweep everything up. And so we're doing a story on this, and I was like, there's an underwater component I can do, so I can, make, I can make a better picture if I also shoot something from the ocean itself. And the editor was like, do you know how to dive? I was like, yes, the last time I dove was when I was, you know, 15. But yes, I remember the basics of it. She's like, okay, you know, go rent yourself uh, an underwater camera. And so I, 
I have this a small little Sony camera. I didn't I didn't know anything about about big underwater housings at this point. So I just bought like a small little housing for my camera, and I was like, I can make this picture totally. I rushed to get refreshed in the scuba diving like the day before I flew off to Palau. And while I was there, the New York Times travel section we were like, oh, there's this um, this island, you know, that that has jellyfish. I was like, yeah, I know this is like Jellyfish Lake. It's very crazy, in the you know. Uh, 10,000 years ago, during the last ice age, these volcanic rocks came up out of the sea and cut this, this, the water off from the ocean. It's still the same ocean life. It's a salt water lake, but nothing could escape. And after 10,000 years, the jellyfish of all the creatures that got cut off were the, organis the, the organism that won you know, the survival of fittest. And they killed everything in this lake. And after 10,000 years, they also evolved. They were like, well, we're the only things in here, so we probably shouldn't sting each other. So evolution happens, which is great, and the jellyfish don't sting. So you can go swimming with these jellyfish up to about 30 feet. Below 30 feet, you have the decomposing bodies of all the jellyfish after thousands and thousands of years. So if you spend more than two to three minutes past 30 feet, you'll absorb so much um, of the, uh, the, the decomposing um, nitrogen in the water that you will end up having a cardiac arrest and just die. So they don't allow scuba diving and you just have to free dive in this jellyfish lake and, you know, uh, for a short amount of time because beyond that, uh, you could absor uh, just absorb too many of the chemicals in the water. So th this is basically what it looks like. And actually, you can't even go back now. They're all dead. They're all gone. Um, because the jellyfish work through, they can't all be millions and millions of jellyfish in a lake nonstop. Um, so what they do is they enter a, a, a medusa stage, and they actually kind of drop down. They go back into these small little larva stage until the lake refreshes, until some of the chemicals leave, until there's the forest feeds the lake with uh, more carbon dioxide. And so there's this whole, like, every thousand years, they disappear, they come back. Uh, scientists are hoping that these would come back in the next 10 years. They haven't shown up. And after I made these images, the New York Times was, again, this is about, about recognizing uh, opportunity and jumping on it. The New York Times travel section was like, you know, we have $8,000 left in the fiscal year-end budget. And uh, is there a project you would want to do? Uh, and I was like, oh, uh, how about sharks? Um, how about great white sharks? Because while I'm at it, I'm not going to do a dinky shark. You might as well, if someone's saying, what do you want to do? Go, go for the gold. And so again, I'm just getting back into scuba diving. I've decided to now rent an underwater housing, and I'm really not sure what I'm doing. But I decide I might as well take the gamble and do it. Uh, and so I go cage diving in Guadalupe. Um, of course, the New York Times is like, we need a photograph of the cage to tell the story about cage diving. So you're going to have to leave the cage at some point to make this image. And me being me, I was like, yes, I can do that. Um, so I had the dive master I was with, uh, with hold a frozen head of a tuna fish, about five pounds, just about five feet in, on top of me. And the back of my legs are being held by someone else um, on the backside of an open cage. And I'm floating. And this pregnant female is just coming in. And she gets, she's going right up for the tuna fish head. And all I do is exhale. And I drop right down underneath her. And I did manage to cut the other. There was no do-over for the shot. So <laughs> it, it was what it was. Um, this is a, a female post-copulation um, shark mating. Since my kids are here, I'm not going to go into how horrible it is. Um, but basically, male, uh, females are much, much bigger than male sharks. And in order to make everything happen, to fit together like a Lego piece, uh, the males need to turn upside down. But when a shark turns upside down, it passes out goes into a trance. So the males, much like horses, if anyone's seen horses mate, they have to bite down on the female in order to not die 
because then they'll like spin and come apart again. So uh, they, and no one's ever seen this. This is the cool thing, is no one has ever seen great whites mate. It happens at about 400 feet deep in the middle of the ocean. Um, most sharks go even deeper. So we have no ability to do that because we don't know where they're gonna do it and can't be like, surprise, we're here to photograph you. Yeah, but basically what we think happens is they come, they spin, they turn over, it happens in an instant, so most people, right? Uh, and um, <laughs> typical, I know, I know. Um, but so the male has to bite down to prevent them from passing out so they can separate again. So you can always spot a, a female who's just uh, mated because she'll have like crazy bite marks on her gills. Of course, the th cool thing about sharks is they heal right away. So in about three weeks, this will be gone. Uh, this is actually a much smaller male who's kind of coming right out. The way you could tell what a male looks like is right here. Um, this is right on top of me where the, uh, the, the bait is right on top of me. Um, there's actually two things. These are called claspers. Male have two penises. Um, yeah, I know you knew it. Because <laughs> I've told you that story. Um, because sometimes they get bitten off in post-coital, not awesome interactions. Um, two for good luck. I like it, KK. <laughs> He's on top of it. I can't wait for puberty with this one. It's going to be so... Two for good luck. That's right. So this was, this was like the moment for me. Um, uh, this is actually shot, uh, which was actually great. I was using the A9, the Sony A9, right when it came out with the 12 to 24. This is shot at 12. Um, at 20 frames a second, so I was able to catch this. This is Persephone. She is the third biggest great white shark ever recorded in Pacific waters, 18 and a half feet long. Uh, she's giant. And since this is a 12, she's about 10 feet from me when this happened. Um, what's interesting is As a war photographer, I'm used to experiencing war through the viewfinder. I don't see that person dying. I don't see that bomb blast. I don't see those people crying at a funeral. I don't see the blood until I take my camera down. When it's up in front of my face, and I'm, whether I'm photographing in Iraq or underwater, I'm seeing the image. I'm not in that space because I'm seeing the image through the viewfinder. It cuts you off emotionally from experiencing what you're actually in, what the environment you're actually in. One of the interesting things about underwater photography is I can't cut off the fact that I'm wearing a skin tight wetsuit and that the water is freezing cold and that I have to think about how much nitrogen I'm taking in, um, what rate of breathing I'm in, you know, Am I sinking? Am I going up? What's my dive computer say? So all of a sudden, even though I'm photographing, I'm not cutting myself off from the situation because I still had a moment when this happened. I just didn't say that for them. Um, and that's what's interesting is like when I'm doing the underwater work, I'm also experiencing being underwater while I'm photographing. Uh, this is a male re-entering the right on top of me, basically. Again, this is with a 12 millimeter lens, so I just want to preface with this is all much closer in real life than in what the photographs uh, show. Um, and it's an amazing experience because no matter how much you think you're able to do, and I know like just from going back and forth to war zones for, for years, like I know what my experience was, I know what my fear level is, I know what I'm willing to do, I know how I would react uh, to certain situations. There's a, there's a basic reptilian part of our brains that when you see a predator, like we are predators on land. On land, like when a cow sees us, it knows to fear us, probably. There's like, you know, polar bears, black, black bears don't even, like black bears run away from human beings, but polar bears, they know that they're the predator on land. Otherwise, we're it, right? Maybe a lion. Underwater, 
We got nothing. We're not even supposed to be there. Nature didn't even say go underwater. Diving is the most ridiculous thing. When you think you can't go far, like to go 100 feet takes planning. Just to go 100 feet takes me time to come back up. I've been training to go 250 feet, and it's going to take me seven hours to come back up from 250 feet. I can spend five minutes making a photograph of a giant linefish at 250 feet, and it's going to take me seven and a half hours to come back up just to make one photograph for a couple of minutes. We're not supposed to be there. And then when you see the A1 predator of the ocean right in front of you, it's humbling. You might have been smiling at me, <laughs> thinking, that's a little more dinner than I want to deal with. Um, when fins are down, it's an attack pattern. Uh, sharks work very much like our shoulders. So when they're pissed off, their fins go down. It goes all the way down when they're coming in really close to attack. So this is kind of an in-between. I'm sort of pissed off, but not really yet. Um, I wanted some more interaction, like you know, cage diving. And, and it's very hard to get out of the cage, and the permits required to swim with great whites. And I, I, you know, I take that very carefully, like how I'm going to do that. Um, but my wife and I, we decided to go to Cuba, and we both photographed and videoed um, the Jardines de la Rena, which is this beautiful, untouched uh, personal reserve of Castro uh, before he died. He was a big, uh, big scuba diver. And so he only let about 900 divers go a year to this area. And we ended up getting an underwater research visa, and we're able to get much closer interaction with uh, wildlife in this area. Um, so this is you know, cage free and we're just diving uh, with these guys. And it was, it's just an amazing experience, it's so different. During the presidential campaigns, uh, I always had to talk to people. Right? I always had to like, you know, if someone was screaming fake news at me or, I mean, which it happened a lot. And you know you have to like go into these situations. Yes, I'm working for Time Magazine and you have to negotiate and talk to people and people have different political beliefs and people see my tattoos and think one thing or I'm wearing a tie and people think another thing. And you're always, and it's the same with any type of photography on land where you're dealing with people. And all of a sudden I realized underwater, these, they don't care. They don't care if I'm, I'm a Democrat or if I'm a Republican, if I'm Christian, if I'm Jewish or I'm Muslim, left or right. They don't even know what news is. And all of a sudden, you can't talk to anyone, right? You can't be like, wait, hold that shot. Let me do that again. And it's just, it's all visceral. And it's amazing. Like photography, when I started with street photography, this idea that street photography, walking around the city capturing stuff, it's all visceral. You just react and you photograph and you move on. But it's not anymore. It's like this negotiation. It's this negotiation you have with the street. Um, and now everyone's aware of street photography. Everyone with the, you know, my mom had takes street photography. Well, not really. She just photographs flowers and sends me pictures of them. But, uh, you know, with her iPhone, everyone has a camera in their back pocket. So how do you break out of that? How do you think about negotiating and talking? And, and then, oh, it's so much. And I thought there's something so pure about being underwater and not being able to communicate with these creatures except by being there. And when you get something that's nicely composed, you're like, wow, I can actually make a composition in the water and not drown. Um, we were, Mar Marvie and I were both in, in the water for this. Uh, this is Nino. Uh, we fed him 10 raw chickens before I even got in the water. So there's, a, there's this little little thing kind of coming out. That's the last of the last chicken. It's like a little sinew of chicken coming out of his mouth. I was like, he's moving slower after 10 raw chickens. Uh, maybe it's good for me to actually get in and swim with him. Um, and we both kind of circled around him. And uh, uh, you know, I'll tell you what, we have seen 20 foot long saltwater crocodiles in person. They are giant and they're terrifying and they scare me more than sharks. And you can actually Google 
saltwater crocodiles taking out sharks, um, they are more maneuverable because they can twist and turn and use their tail. Uh, and as they turn the shark over and they just feast on it. They are terrifying to be in the water with. And like, I know how a fish moves. I, I, I almost like the, the reptile part of it is terrifying because also they look like great giant dinosaurs. Um, and now that Marvie and I are both parents, and we did a lot of this shark work together, uh, and we like left our kids at home with my mom or, or her mom, and we were like, oh, you know, we're not doing war zone work anymore, and like it's not like we're gonna take our kids to Afghanistan, but what if we take them with us and start working as a family together? Um, and this was like one of the big impetuses for a, a motivation for why we wanted to change our careers. Uh, we used to live in Kenya. Marvi, for years, worked on uh, uh, female genital mutilation out there. Um, and it's nothing that we could have involved our kids in. But all of a sudden now, we can travel and do this underwater work from our perspective and also take our family with us. So my son, Mateo, was actually in the water with me when I made this image. Um, and so we started doing whale sharks, which are, you know, whale sharks, biggest fish in the ocean. They're majestic. Uh, they're the size of a school bus. And they're completely harmless to human beings. Uh, we probably caused them more harm. Uh, and I thought this was like a great way, and we both thought this was a great way to introduce our kids to this, like, this, you know, stuff we were doing now. And just jumping in and, and swimming with them. And I remember as I made this image, Marvie's right next to me. And I look up and I'm like, I, I could do this forever. I could honestly, this is so, I, I actually ended up getting a tattoo of a whale shark because I felt like that was the biggest transition for a moment for me. I was like, I don't need to go back to Iraq. I don't need to go back to Afghanistan right now because I'm sort of, I, for a long time, the wars and work was what fulfilled me. It was like a reason for why I was a photographer. And now I understood that it was, a, it was experiencing the world and experiencing like the beauty of everything that's out there, not just one part of it, that was fulfilling. Um, and actually, that's, so that's Marvy off, off on the side, or Mateo, I can't tell because you always wear the same size wetsuits. Um, and, you know, so we, we started swimming with bigger sea turtles. And this was amazing because our kids are with us at the same time that we're doing this. So here is, is uh, KK and, and Marvy with this guy. And this is in the middle of the sea. You know, like, and this whole idea of we can include our whole family. And then these guys end up learning. And because what can, you know, I think one of the things that was, is, was and this is uh, Mateo and me and, and the whale shark. One of the things that frustrated me about my coverage of Iraq was that no one cared. I spent six years and uh, my body is damaged and I have PTSD and I've seen people die. I've been covered in other men's blood. Um, I had to carry cellulox and, and, all the, and, and learn how to be a medic because of what I saw and what I had to do. I've had friends who have died. And I needed to find a way to say, people need to care about this. And what happened is I would come back to New York and uh, I realized no one cared. I mean, maybe it wasn't like Vietnam where the chances are you might know someone who was in the draft. And so people in general cared. And I think there was more care in the anti-war movement in Vietnam. I'm, I wasn't alive back then, but I'm just assuming. Uh, than, than the Iraq war. Like, people weren't up in arms. People weren't saying, stop. Like, the Af Afghanistan war is now the longest war that we've ever been in. And I think I just read an article that a son is now patrolling the same place in Kandahar on his tour that his father was on. That's ridiculous. And the thing is, though, that so many of us just, we don't care. And part of it is media. It's not necessarily the media industry. It's that we went from seeing 
When I started in photography, 1,000 images a day. To most of us now see 5,000 images a day. And at some point, nothing gets through. Like it doesn't make an impact. And one of the things that would bother me is that my work wasn't making an impact. And if you look at Iraq now or look at Afghanistan, who is there? I don't know any photographers who are working there outside of like some wires. Because now no one's paying for medical insurance. No one's paying normal rates. Like you can't even make a living as a, a conflict photographer anymore. Um, and I felt frustrated that like I had to find a way to make my work mean something. And so all of a sudden I felt like being with my family and making those images was meaning something to them. <laughs> so um, my son, uh, Mateo, who's here in the front, who, you gonna stand up? He's actually going uh, diving with great white sharks with me in two months, uh, along with Marvy. KK's sitting that one out, because he's a little too small. Uh, but Mateo's fearless, and he wants to go do great whites. And so I decided, uh, Marvy and I decided we needed to get him ready. And so we taught him how to scuba dive. And then we took him, I've been working with this one colony of sea lions in Mexico for the last year. Uh, this is the karate chop image. Um, and, and I felt this is like a good place to get um, Mateo started on diving. About, and it's, a, it's, a, it's about having this impact, but where I'm having the impact is like the next generation, is someone I actually know. And so, you know, I spent a while photographing these guys, which are very friendly. They're not mean at all. They like love chewing on cameras and fins and regulator tubes and oxygen tubes and basically everything that keeps you alive, um, but they don't know that. But they're, they're very fun creatures. They're cute, yes. They're very cute, KK. Just like you. Oh, oops. Yeah, so this is like, you know, you go into these caves where the juveniles uh, are. Uh, these are like the teenage, you know, I have a little bit of an attitude, sea lions. Um, and it, it's a really interesting environment. This is a, a, this is a colony that doesn't have a lot of predators. Uh, and just a bunch of giant males who are terrifying. Um, so bull sea lions, the males, are giant, and they bark at you underwater. And you're not supposed to hear anything underwater. It's supposed to be like space. No one can hear you scream. But you can hear them barking at you. And so it's very foreign. You, sat, it, you think it's like a dog, like a German shepherd is underwater barking at you, and it feels wrong. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, I will show this video that um, Marvi, who is my, the lead thinker in everything that I do, um, wrote the script for this, and we shot it together uh, about uh, teaching Mateo how to scuba dive and passing on sort of our passion uh, to the next generation. There's space bar. Mom, how big are tiger sharks? Do we kill lemon sharks? Why do people eat sharks? Like, how big are Do we they? kill it for a sport on purpose? Have you swam with them? They ask us all these questions. And we could talk to them about all the problems. Global warming, bleached coral, rising waters, mass extinction, pollution. And it's overwhelming. It makes me feel sad that people kill animals that are in the people sea. People litter in the ocean, killing every single animal. But when they're in the water, their excitement washes away our despair. And we hope that with every experience we give them, that they are driven to cherish the ocean, to cherish life, and to be part of the solution. Because this generation, these children, 
They are the embodiment of hope. I wish if I was a sea lion, you know that, Dad? You wish you were a sea lion? Yeah. They're beautiful. I agree. So part two with Mateo getting eaten by a great white shark. We'll be in about two months. Check in on that. Um, see if, I, if we win parenting awards for throwing our, our bait. He's going to be bait. But again, guys, thank you so much. Um, and happy to...